All right, we're starting 2.9, and this has to do with something called the inverse function, and uh, we also have to think about something called one-to-one -one functions. Again, well, something that we need when we get to exponential functions and logarithmic functions. So we're sort of setting it up right now. All this little good stuff here, but in a nutshell, what does an inverse function do? do it actually undoes whatever the function does so we have a few inverse functions here so if you add 5 the inverse of that would be subtract 5 yep if you square something the inverse of that would be square root something with that one there's a little a little bit of a problem there but we'll talk about it as we get there okay all right so let's go for it so before we get to the whole concept of an inverse function, we've got to talk about one-to-one -one functions. All right, and again, hopefully you have your book out as well here. A one-to-one -one function just means that every single y value has only one corresponding x value. And so you've got to think of it sort of this way here. Certain things are functions. Certain functions are not one-to-one, -one and certain functions are one-to-one. -one. So the function rule sort of applies in two different aspects here. So I guess we should delineate this here. And again, I have a little graphic here. It's in the textbook as well. Sometimes it could be not a function at all. Sometimes it is a function. Out of this one, this one actually still divides into two different categories. We call it a one-to-one -one function. And we can just say not one-to-one -one function. So there's, so this is going to be a very specific function that we can take inverses of. That's kind of what we're trying to get at. But let's take a look at something here. So this one would be a one-to-one -one function. Notice for every single x, you have a completely different y. There's never a time where you have a one x. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I guess you should say uh, two y's having the same x, because you can have that in terms of a function. We'll talk about it in just a second here. This one is not a one-to-one -one function. Notice the x2 and x3, they both go to y2. Again, no longer a one-to-one -one function. Let's go back real quick here. I don't know. Let's see. I'll, I'll go one more time here. This one right here, bless you, this one right here is actually not a function at all, right? It fails the function test x2 can go to y2 and y3. So let's do maybe like a little graphic of this first here. So something that's not even a function, right? It does something like this. That's not even a function because a certain x, let's say this one right here, let's say it's 4. 4 goes up to 2, 4 goes up to 4, and also 4 goes up to negative 4. That's not even a function. It, pass, it does not pass the vertical line test. We're good. Going back over here, let's say this is going to be a function. This is a prime example. But it's not a one-to-one -one function. This is a function, right? Isn't that x squared there? But notice if I put a, uh, let's say, let's put a 2 in here. <clears throat> a 2 for x squared, what's the y value? going to be a 4, right? Because if you square, a 2 is going to be a 4. But also at the same time, you notice on the negative 2 side, if you do that same thing over here, you're going to wind up also with a 4. So that's kind of what happens here on this mapping here. A, a 2 gets mapped to 4. A negative 2 also gets mapped to a 4. Good there? <coughs> Okay, and then let's go to a one-to-one -one function. This one, more like this. How about x cubed? I like that. That's a pretty good one here for a one-to-one -one function. Is there any x that gives you the same exact y's? No. They're all, we call them, they're all unique values, right? So a positive 2 goes up to a positive 4. A negative 2 goes down to negative 4. That is called a one-to-one -one function. All right, some other one-to-one -one functions. 
a new linear value. That's a one-to-one -one function, right? Okay, now let's go on just a little bit more. Anything that is forever increasing or anything that is decreasing. Is that true? Is that a would that be considered a one-to-one -one function? Because right, if it turns, if it starts increasing, then you got same values for y. There's the problem. So in this one, x cubed, it's forever increasing, right? There's never a time it starts decreasing. Same thing here. I can flip it upside down. Again, forever decreasing. And that's okay. That really is a one-to-one -one function. In calculus, you guys are going to say it is strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. That's kind of the language. Okay, with that said, hey, you know what? You know how we have a vertical line test in order to determine if something is a function? If something is forever increasing or decreasing, doesn't that really mean I can test this by a horizontal line test? Doesn't that make sense? Cool. There it is. Forever decreasing or strictly decreasing. Bam, there it is too. So here's what we say. <clears throat> kind of careful on the, on the words. Make sure you understand it. It says a function is one-to-one -one if no horizontal line intersects the graph of f in more than one point. And anybody give me the page number that is written on? Page 271. So let's get into some definitions here. Again, try to finish up quickly here. Let's do this horizontal line test here. This is the um, test for the one-to-one -one property, example number one. And again, a straight line. Does that pass a horizontal line test? Absolutely, right? Number two, yes or no? Yeah, x squared minus 1, no way. There's the decreasing, there's increasing, there's two values for giving me a one single y value. Okay, and how about this one, the square root function, will that pass the horizontal line test? Yeah, absolutely, right? It hits at one single spot for the rest of the time. Okay. <clears throat> Practice problem number one, and let me open it just to make sure I got it. Okay, now that you so x minus one squared. Now you should be able to graph this x minus one squared. Um, square function and it goes one to the anybody left right up or down let me give you the function here sorry those of you that don't have a book yet or in front of them today there it is you should be able to graph that based upon what we did on Tuesday or the library of functions and transformations here it doesn't that isn't that one to the right so it's the x squared function and one moved off to the right. So it looks like this. And then one moved off to the right. There's my vertex. So the graph goes like this. And again, all this stuff is sort of stringing together here. You should be able to look at that and graph it right away. All right. And quick question. Does this pass the horizontal line test? No way. So it does not pass. Horizontal line test, therefore, this is a not one to one function. Okay, another concept for you to say, oh, I get it now. This is the aha moment. I'll let you guys finish copying that down first. All right, let's go on. So if it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, it is not a one-to-one -one function. Next concept that we have to get in order to get this stuff. 
is this here. So if f represents a one-to-one -one function, then if y is in the range of f, there's only one value huh, of y in the domain of f of x equals y. We'll get there. Talking about the domain values here. Notice what's happening here. First, so first of all, I guess some definitions here. First of all, is f is our function. Whenever we find the inverse, inverse is going to be f to the negative 1. Again, does not mean reciprocal. It's not in the exponent. It's next to a function. So this little dash 1, it just means inverse function. We're sort of running out of symbols in mathematics. We have to reuse symbols. So if you see a negative 1 next to a function name, you're talking about inverse. Okay, what does this say? It's a very sort of basic definition of inverse. It just means this. If you have a function that goes f of x is equal to y, the inverse function is you take the y value and you bring it back to the x. So it undoes the work. Again, let's take a look at it in terms of uh, individual points. Then we'll take a look at it in terms of equations here. And again, just for us to understand the work itself, example, example number two in the textbook here, if f of 3 is equal to 5, what in the world would be f inverse of 5? It would be 3, of course, right? Because it just takes the y value, brings it back to the x value that it started with. So it undoes the work. So f inverse of negative 1 is 7. Therefore, the function of 7 is negative 1. Your job for practice problem number 2, all yours there. Write it down if you want to, or just do the work itself. That's fine. All right, we good? So f of negative 3 becomes 12. f inverse of 12 is? Negative 3. Brings it back to the x value that it started with. f inverse of 4 is 9, so f of 9 is 4. Good there? So it's switching x's and y's, technically. That's what you got. I like the graphic here on page 273. I thought it kind of makes sense here. I'm going to redraw it because I didn't have a chance to draw it out here. These are all the domains. This is x. This is all the range values, technically y. And functions do this, right? They take from x, they give you a y value. So this would be f. What the inverse function does, it takes the y value and brings it back to the x function. So it's just undoing the work. <clears throat> all right. So if this was, if the function was, again, a little simple illustration here, we'll get to some major ones here. If this was uh, x plus 3, what would the inverse function be? I know you're thinking it, just don't want to say it, I understand. Minus 3, right? <clears throat> so if I take x, let's say x is 5 x equals 5. As it goes over here, y is going to equal 8. Is that right? And then when I take that 8 value, and notice real quick here, I switched it on you, huh? It's f inverse of x. I didn't put f inverse of y because this is still my input, but it's my input for my inverse function. So we'll get to that notation in just a second here. So if I take the input and put 8 in here, what's going to be my output? 
back to 5, back to over here, this space here. So, just real quick here, what happens if I would do this? What do you think that would be? Starting a different position, we're starting at 8, right? If we do, we start off at the inverse function, isn't this what we do here? Let's use x equals 8 as the example in here. So if I take 8, I do the inverse function, it becomes a 5. We good? If I take 5 and I use the function, it becomes an 8 again. Right? Because it's just cycling through. Tell me if you guys agree with this statement, see if this makes sense. If I use both those functions at the same time, I'll just end up with just x again. Because the function undid the inverse functions work. So here's what we got. This is on page 273. It says if I take the if it's a one-to-one -one function and I take f composed with f inverse of x, what will happen is I'll just get x. I'll get what I started with. If I go the other way, why do we need to go the other way? Because we learned that it's not commutative. Remember on Tuesday? We learned that if you take f of g, it's not the same thing as taking g of f. And they are different. So yes, you do have to do t both cases to see if that is true. All right, so let's, let's look at one here. Again, page 273, this is where it's at. All right, this is more talking about whether to check whether two things are inverses of each other. So if you take a function, take its inverse, and you got x, you've un everything is undone each other's work, and you got yourself an inverse function. Sometimes we kind of don't know if they are inverses or not. And so the next slide is talking about that. It just says this. If I take a f function and a g function, and I compose them, so f composed with g gives me an x. Then I go the other way, and I go g composed with f gives me an x. If both of these are true, then I know that g is really the inverse function of f because it has undone the other functions work both ways. Okay, so let's look at an example here, then let you guys try practice problem. First of all, an example. So notice sort of what's happening here. This is a good example from the textbook here. I take this x from my function, I multiply by 2, and I add 3. What would be the opposite operations here? Well, if I take the x, I subtract 3, and then I divide by 2. Notice those are just undoing the other functions work. So take these two functions here, I compose them. So take the g function as we learned Tuesday how to do that, and everybody tried their homework already, so everybody knows exactly how to do this. And take the g function into the f function, the 2's will cancel. Plus 3, minus 3 cancels as well. Notice you just have yourself an x by itself. Can't just do it one way, you got to do it both ways. So now we got to go the other way. g composed with f. So take the f function, take it into the g function. 3's cancel, the 2's cancel, leaving you with x. So they undid each other's work, therefore these guys are inverse functions of each other. Of course, that's the easy example. You guys get the sophisticated, more difficult challenge. So verify for me that 3x minus 1 and x plus 1 divided by 3 if those are inverse functions. And again, give you guys a minute, try it yourself.
All right, let me do it the forward way, if you guys are stuck. So F composed with G of X. So I t uh, this would be then, again, algebraically, it's F of G of X, and G is X plus 1 over 3. So I'm going to take that and plug it into the F function here. So it's 3 times X plus 1 over 3 minus 1. The 3's cancel. X plus 1 minus 1, and notice I just have X by itself. So then F undid the work of G. That's kind of what we did there. Going the other way, G composed with F of X. Take the G function, and then I'm going to write the equation for the F function inside it. So it's 3X minus 1. Plugging that into the G function, so on top it becomes 3X minus 1 plus 1 over 3. Again, in this case, the 1's go away. And 3x divided by 3. So in this case, the g undid the work of f. And then at that point, we verify that those two are inverse functions of each other. And again, all this is really set up for exponential and logarithmic functions. We'll see those later. <clears throat> Some textbooks leave this out, and they do it in the beginning of that chapter, with logarithmic exponential functions. Your textbook sort of does it in the beginning when it explains functions. Then it goes from there. Okay, so let's see. We took a look at um, inverse functions by points, we took a look at them by equations, and now let's take a look at them by graphs. What do they look like when we graph them? And what kind of symmetry do we have? So first of all, with symmetry, there it is, kind of interesting. The graph of the function f and the graph of the function f inverse are symmetric. That's cool. But they are symmetric with respect to this line y equals x. So not symmetric with the y-axis, not the x-axis, not the origin. There's a sort of fourth kind of symmetry here. All right, let's go for it here. And again, this is the example in the textbook here. That would be helpful here. So notice this is the, the pink or the red line. This is the line that we're going to take the reciprocal of. I'm sorry, the inverse of. But again, think about what does inverse do. It flips the x and the y, right? So all we're going to do is we're going to take that 4, 3. We're going to graph it as 3, 4 over here. We're going to take that negative 1, 2. We're going to graph it as... 2, negative 1, which is down here. And let me change it to an arrow. We're going to take negative 3, negative 5, and now we're going to graph it as negative 5, negative 3. And again, as we collect, uh, connect now the purple line looks like, it's symmetric with this little line y equals x. So it's almost like if you folded the x and y coordinates, or the Cartesian coordinate plane, you folded it, the pink line should fall right on top of the purple line. Are we good? Ah, because you're not changing the signs on the x and the y. You're just changing, you're just flipping them. If you were to flip them and change the signs, then you got origin. Cool. Actually, no, if you were just, if you're not changing the coordinates, but you were just changing the signs on x and y, then you would get symmetry about the origin. All right, our job, all yours for here. If you want to graph it on your sheet of paper, there's the practice problem here. Can you give me or sketch for me the graph of f inverse?
right, cool. I'm going to try it as well here. So <clears throat> on my sheet of paper, I have to redraw the function itself there. So negative 2, negative 4. Let me just check just real quick here. Yep, negative 2, negative 4. 1, negative 2, and then 3, 4. That's my original graph. A graph of the inverse function then would be switching of those two. So negative 4, negative 2. Negative 2, 1. And then 3, 4 becomes 4, 3. So again, connecting those dots. Got that. And no, you don't need to draw the y equals x graph. But just know, is it symmetric about that line? Sure looks like it, right? Cool. Okay. Just making sure you guys got the same. We're good there. <clears throat> All right. Next. Next is actually finding the inverse function. What happens if you're given a function? You need to find the inverse function. So this is the procedure for it. Again, don't need to write it down. But the main thing is, if the inverse function only replaces x's and y's, we can actually replace the variables themselves. So we're going to interchange the x variable and the y variable. And if we can solve back for y again, we have ourselves our inverse function. Let's try an easy example here. Actually, let's look at an easy example from the textbook here. Linear equation. This f of x, we say that's a function. Real quick here, is this a one-to-one -one function? Yeah, it's a linear function, has a slope of 3, passes at negative 3, negative 4 along the y-intercept. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, and on the directions, it will actually tell you. This is a 1 to 1 function. Find its inverse. So on the directions of the homework, it should. But f of x turns into a y value. And here's that second step here. We're going to switch our x's and y's. And all we got to do at this point, solve again for the y value. So add 4, divide by 3. I got this guy. I was able to solve for y. And then I declared this guy to be the inverse function. Again, don't need to write it down. It is inside your textbook. But the one that you probably should do, or at least try, is this one here. So practice problem number five. Give you guys a minute here. This is the easy one. All right, hopefully you guys are done. So again, uh, f of x is replaced by y. Then what we do is we switch x and y's, the variables themselves. At this point, then we start solving for y again if we can. So subtract 3 from both sides. Divide through by a negative 2 this time. And we understand that I can divide each of those through by a negative 2. Will that work there? If I like to do that, that's fine. I think that's the way it's written in the back of the book as the answer. So I did it that way. If you want to leave the 2 on the bottom, that's fine. Put the negative out in front. So there's my f inverse is a negative 1 half x plus 3 halves. Uh, I should write it in this way here as well. So if you just divided by negative 2 and you left it like this, that's fine as well. Then the answer should have been... The only thing is we don't really leave negatives on the bottom of fractions here. So what we do, we put a, probably put in front. You could put in front like this, in front of the fraction itself. Or the more common one, you probably have to put the negative on top. But if you put the negative on top, notice the x becomes negative, but the 3 becomes positive. Cool. So any one of those would have been just fine.
Okay, a little tougher one here. How about this one here? We have a rational function, x plus 1 over x minus 2, and it already tells you that x can't be equal to 2 right away. It is also tells you it's a one-to-one -one function. So this is an example in the textbook. <clears throat> f of x becomes a y. Again, don't need to write it down. It's in the textbook here. The x and y switch. And what we do, as we've done before, we multiply through by the common denominator, which is y minus 2. And then we distribute the x. The only thing that happens different right over here is I see a y on this side. I also see a y on this side I'm trying to solve for. So when I move this y over here, i got a minus y. I'm going to add the 2x to both sides. I have something looks like this. And since I have y's in two different spots, I'm going to have to factor out the y. That's sort of the only big thing there. Get all the y terms together on one side, factor out the y, and then divide by what's left over. Hey, that's interesting. Look at that. x plus 2x plus 1 over x minus 1 is the inverse function for this guy. All right, what we also have to do at the end is to declare this guy here. So x cannot be equal to 1 because it's not part of this. It's not even part of the domain. We're good there? So sort of state your domain for that. All right, let's go for it. All yours there. x over x plus 3. Can you give me the inverse function? All right, let me start it as well here. So look up if you're stuck, or look up if you're done just to see. So f of x gets changed into a y value, so x over x plus 3. Kind of slightly off, so I can have more room here to put two columns in here. There's that, and what we do is we switch x and y, so now the y becomes x, the x becomes a y, and we multiply through by x, so oh, sorry, y plus 3 on one side, y plus 3 on the other. And we distribute the x. So how about x times y? x times 3. 
And in this place, the, the Y plus 3s are gone. They cancel completely. All right, in this case, uh, I think I'm going to just bring the X, Y over on this side here. Let's see, or bring the, the Y over to this side here. That becomes Y, and move that 3X to the other side. So I have a negative 3X. And there's that little factor step we got to do. There's two terms with the Y in it. In order to get one term with the Y, we factor out the Y value. Cool. And then divide through by X minus 1. So negative 3X over X minus 1. We've, we're able to solve for Y. That's perfect. And then we declare this to be the inverse function. So in this case, it would be F inverse of X is equal to. And we'll leave it just like that. Okay, and now let's talk a little quickly about this here. Notice it's not f inverse of y, it's f inverse of x. And the reason because it's x is because we switched this little step right here. We switched our x's and y values. Okay, and then one more. And another little consideration that we have. Remember when we did domain and range earlier in the class? Like domain for this guy is pretty easy to see, right? X can't be equal to negative 3. But remember how I told you, in order to get the range of this, what you really have to do is you have to graph it. Well, not necessarily. Because notice what we do with the inverse function, we actually exchange our X's and Y's. So if we go over here, what can x not be? Yeah, it can't be equal to 1. But hold on, though, just a real quick and think about it. If this can't be equal to 1, and I switch my x's and y's, doesn't that mean, come over here, doesn't that mean for this function here that y can be equal to 1 over here? Also, since we switch our x and y's, doesn't that mean that uh, since the function itself does not equal to 3, doesn't that mean over here that's what's happening? Right, because their x and y's are both switched. So if I know, let's see this, if we can say this here, if I know the domain of my function, I automatically know the range of my inverse function. If I know the domain of my inverse function, I automatically know the range of my function. Good. There. An example here about domain and range. Again, from your textbook here. Domain of my function, easy, easily given. I can look at that and say x does not equal 2. To get the range without having to graph it all, what we do is we switch our x's and y's. We solve for the inverse function, and we find out, oh, look at that. My inverse function says x can be equal to 1. Therefore, my range of f is not including the positive 1. And again, interval notation is the best way we like to draw it out. So there's my domain, and there's my range. OK, good there? Let's try one. So tell me the domain and the range for this function right here. And before you start calculating the inverse function, hold on, hold on. Do we actually know the inverse function of this? x over x plus 3. Yeah, we just did it previously, right? So if that's the function itself, the inverse function is, I did it. It was negative 3x, x minus 1. Cool. So domain, again, d for domain, says that x cannot be equal to 3 or negative 3. So the interval notation for the domain for f is negative infinity to negative 3 parentheses, union, negative 3 to infinity. There's my domain. All right, range, depending on how you want to say it, you can say y does not equal to 1. 
or you can write it out in interval notation, which is, I think, the way the back of the book has it, is negative infinity to 1 union parentheses 1 comma infinity. Okay, we're good there? So recap as we go here. So we learned what it, in the world is an inverse function. We learned what 1 to 1 is, first of all. And if you have a 1 to 1 function, we learned the inverse functions are just switching the x's and the y's. It's undoing the work. We're able to do it graphically, we're able to do it by points, and we're able to do it by equation. And then what we did is we actually found the inverse function from an equation. Now we can find the domain and range. Once you have domain and range of the function, you all automatically know the domain and range of the inverse function, right? So now we're looking at domain and range there. Okay, so let's come to the problem that we had before. We said that if you have x squared, that is no longer a function, right? So this guy, it's not a one-to-one -one function at all. So there's no way I can have an inverse function of this, except for one little simple fact. What happens if I did this? What happens if I said, you know what, I'm only going to count the domain that is like this. Ooh, so even on functions that are not one-to-one, -one, if I limit my domain, I can make them to be one-to-one. -one. Because if x squared is my function, but my domain restriction is only numbers that are greater than or equal to zero, all this goes away, right? So now does it pass the horizontal line test? Absolutely. So with domain restrictions, Actually, I can pretty much make almost any function a one-to-one -one function. Once I have that in place, let's find the inverse function. So let's go to this here. Again, from your textbook here, capital G of X is X squared minus 1. And again, X squared is not going to happen. As the inverse function, if I subtract 1 from it, the graph sort of looks like this, right? It's X squared but the vertex is moved down one. So we have that. But x greater than or equal to zero is the domain restriction, so that goes away. So voila, I got myself a one-to-one -one function. So how do we do this? Again, same, same steps here. We exchange the x's and the y's. We move the one over. And we have to take the square root here. When you take the square root, remember, normally what we do is we put plus or minus. But at this point, we go over here and we ask ourselves, okay, what's going to happen to the y values? The y values are going to have to, remember, because we switched our x's and y's, right? The y values always have to be greater than or equal to zero. So what we do is we reject the one has a negative sign and we only take them with the positive sign. Cool. We got ourselves a square root function that does that. And the book even gives you a graph of it, which kind of helps just to sort of see it. So the blue graph is the original capital G of X. Again, it's a square root function, move down one. Is that pink or red to you guys? What is that? Sort of like a violet red or something. And so the inverse function goes like this. Ooh, look at that. Is that still symmetric along the line y equals x? It's a square root function, but moved off to the a. Let's take a look at this here. It's the square root function, but because that little one, what's happening here? As far as transformations go, It's scooted over left, one unit, right? That's cool. So there it is. Squared function scooted over left, and then there it is. It is the inverse function. Okay, don't need to graph it, but you do have to find the inverse function. So there's my graph of it, just so you can see it. Now, instead of taking the positive side, what I did is I just took the negative side of it. So x is less than or equal to 0. Can you give me 
the inverse function that makes that true. All right, most of you guys are done here, so y is equal to x squared minus 1. Switch the x's and the y's. Solve for y again, so add 1 to both sides. And then what we'll do is we'll take the... Uh, let me switch it around. So y squared on this side, the x plus 1 over here. Take a square to both sides. And again, this whole concept of x is less than or equal to 0 now becomes... y has to be less than or equal to 0. So at this point, we're just going to take the negative value of those. And so there it is. y is equal to the negative square root of x plus 1. Declare that to be the inverse function. You've got to do this step here. If you just leave it as y equals, you don't have it done because you're not declaring it to be the inverse function yet. And there it is as the final answer. <clears throat> okay, you don't need to do a graph of it, but I figured I should do a graph of it here. So this is um, a square root function, which normally goes out like this it's moved back one unit so now it's sort of going out like this and it's a negative in front so now you got yourself a reflection about the x-axis and there's a red line does it still meet in the middle right here absolutely right there it is you can sort of folds on itself away from the little line y equals x Okay, and of course the application question. Where is this stuff found? Why do we need it? Why do we find inverse functions in the first place? <clears throat> this is an example in the textbook here. So a formula for finding water pressure, pounds per square inch at a depth of d feet. So if you put in a value of d, it gives you how much pressure is in that water here. So suppose the pressure gauge on the diving bell breaks and shows a reading of 1800 PSI. How far below the surface the bell was when the gauge failed? Hmm. That's weird. We actually want to put in a, we want to do actually put in 1800 here, right, and actually solve for D. So we're going the opposite way. Even worse is what happens if you have to do 200 of these calculations? Do you really want to put in a pressure here and then do algebra to solve this? Or would you rather solve this for the other variable? I think I'd solve it for the other variable first. So let's go with it here. So example problem here it is. Let's multiply through by 11. There's that. Subtract 165 to this side. And then when you divide through by 5, 5 goes into 165 33 times, and you got yourself now an equation that is just set up for d as opposed to p. Again, that's kind of what an inverse function, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get the other variable. All right, at this point then, then it's, you can write this in an Excel spreadsheet if you like, right? And you can plug in numbers all you like because now you're just number crunching as opposed to solving an algebraic formula. So... <clears throat> 1800 PSI gives you a depth of 3,927 feet below surface low. Interesting. Uh, the new sort of sport out there is actually um, pressure diving. Anybody heard of that before? <clears throat> they go and they um, they go at surface level. You hold your breath. You just take one breath, and you go as far down as you possibly can, as fast as you possibly can. And um, then you reach a certain one, and you're sort of along a cord sort of thing. So you have to reach down to a certain level. You reach that, and then you go back up. And of course, as you're going back up, 
you have carbon dioxide that has built inside you. So you have to release the carbon dioxide as you go. So you have to have enough air inside you to go down and able to come up. You figured, yes, there's a few people that have died already doing the sport, but it's still a sport. Okay, so for our problem, practice problem number nine, we got the same thing, except we have 1650. So can you first, again, just for practice, can you solve P... Uh, the um, equals 5D over 11 plus 15. Can you solve it for D first? And once you got a, the depth equation, then plug it in to figure out what feet you are in. But uh, let's see, 1,650 PSI, that's quite a bit. You figure the tire pressure inside the your car tire is about 30 to 40 PSI. So you can kind of imagine how much pressure there is here. And again, why are uh, submarines sort of tubular in nature? Why do they sort of stick out like a tube? Is because of that reason. Because if you create something that's a convex shape, it's holding outside pressure better. Because if it was the other way, if it looked like two U's put together the other way, you would not have a submarine. Okay, so for practice solving for D, first of all, so with 1650 PSI, P is equal to 5D over 11 plus 15. Multiply through by 11. 11's cancel, and then 11 times 15 is 165. Thank you. All right, see. So, uh, I put the 5D on that side. That's what I did. I put the 11P on that side. It kind of did a little different. If yours looks a little different, that's fine. Divide, multiply through by a negative. Divide through by 5. Eventually, you should get that right there. Alright, once you get that, something about the 33 feet, that's kind of interesting. Because remember on the, if you guys ever had uh, sports watches, remember how you can, um, on the back side it says water resistant to 33 feet. Have you seen that before on the back of a sports watch? But if that's the case, then notice that you get a certain depth here with that 33 feet. You get a certain pressure there. Anyways, leave it for later. Let's go for it here. Plug it in 1650 into that equation now. Dividing out the 5 looks like, multiplying by 11, you get that finally, and then eventually subtracting 33, you get 3,597 feet. Are we good there? Okay, cool. We learned a little something about functions here. There is such thing as inverse functions. And there's a specific type of function called the one-to-one -one function. Kind of cool. Okay, we'll stop here. Um...